Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from the Noble Cube, and in this video I'm looking at the Swedish Tier 8 Premium Multirole Fighter, the Saab J21RB. Hello there, and here on the tarmac outside my hangar is the only Swedish aircraft in World of Warplanes, the J21RB, and it's in RAF livery because I've assigned it to the United Kingdom, one of the five major nations, and you can do that with any of the European and international aircraft for the sum of 100,000 credits. That makes them versatile as crew trainers, a significant advantage for this plane if you're on a budget. In real life, it's one of only two aircraft ever to have successfully been converted from originally using piston engines to a jet engine, the other being the Yak-15. This saw service in the Swedish Air Force in the uh, early 1950s. It's configured as an attack aircraft in this game, and in all truth, that means it should really be called the A21RB, as far as I can tell, because the weapons, the machine guns at the front, have been downgraded slightly from 13.2mm machine guns in the fighter configuration to 12.7mm machine guns in this ground attack configuration. Also, I don't believe that the rockets were necessarily mounted like this underneath the aircraft. I could be wrong about that, because I believe there was also an auxiliary um, pod containing many more machine guns, rather like the um, P-82B twin Mustang. In the game, this is one of the original premium aircraft and means that it meets the original design philosophy of the World of Warplanes team and indeed wargaming in general in that premiums were supposed to be slightly worse than their tech tree equivalents because they gave you the advantages of more credits and crew training capability. Well, of course, things have moved on. So nowadays, many of the reward aircraft that are destined to become premiums are very strong indeed. So how does this aircraft stack up? Well, that's what this video is going to answer for you, I hope. What we're going to do now is take a look at the numbers. If you don't want to look at a spreadsheet, use a link below the video to skip ahead to another part of it. Here we have the spreadsheet showing all of the Tier 8 multi-role fighters. There are 10 of them and they just fit neatly on the screen. If you don't know how this spreadsheet works, there's a link below in the description to an instructional video. Go and watch that and that will tell you what you need to know. Without going into details, straight off these figures shout at you that there's great ordnance, or at least very good ordnance on this aircraft, but the guns are not good at all. Let's get into the gun armament. It's a rating of 20 and it's a cumulative DPS of 360. I'm afraid this is worst in class and my experience is you are going to suffer with this. One of the class specific missions for a multi-role fighter is to defend sectors well. Try defending a sector even against a ground attacker that can't maneuver very well but has a lot of hit points with this armament let alone maneuverable fighters or other multi-roles which are at least if not more maneuverable than you and sadly nowadays some of the heavies are more maneuverable as well or at least as maneuverable i'm thinking of you f82 e twin twin mustang and now also the p61 the armament consists of three weapons groups there's a 20 millimeter cannon with 120 dps 420 rate of fire reasonably good range of 2362 feet Auto aim angle, the amount you can be off target by, and again, correct your aim for you, is 2.5 degrees. Dispersion angle is quite nice at 0.5, that's quite low for a cannon. That means the bullets don't, the shells don't really spread out that much compared to some of the other um, cannons in the game. And the overheat is 10 seconds, which is quite generous, but there is only one of them. And then we've got some wing mounted and some cowling mounted 12.7mm um, machine guns, the ground attack configuration for this aircraft which as far as i can tell in real life was called the a21rb but it's called the j21rb in this game they've got 60 dps each rate of fire 800 the range is actually only 1837 feet the auto aim angle is four it's okay-ish but not great for machine guns dispersion angle of 0.5 which actually is very good and the overheat time is 20 seconds however there's a catch here the shell velocity on the cannon is 1,457 feet per second. It's only not even 1,200 feet per second on the, um, the machine guns. This means that if an aircraft that you're shooting at is banking away from you and it's a fair distance from you, these shells are going to arrive at fairly different times. And that means that your DPS, effective DPS against the aircraft, is going to go down. Now, popular tactic for P61 players is to go up and bank away from you means you're probably only going to be hitting them with either the cannon or the machine guns. It's going to take you forever and a day to knock down a tank like the P-61. So, not great armament, not a good start. 
to compensate for that, we do have the best in class ordnance. It's only rockets, but there are 10 of them. And if you do whatever you can to improve the cumulative damage, which is 16,000 at base and the resupply time, which is 60, you can get these up to a fairly healthy figure. And that will allow you, as I demonstrate, to take out the best part of most special objects at um, sectors. For instance, a mining plant you'll be able to destroy if you know where to fire your rockets and how many to fire at each part of the target. You'll be able to destroy the power plant in the centre with the exception probably of at least some of the chimneys, which you can then try and finish off with the guns. And you'll be able to, for instance, as you will see in the forthcoming battle, be able to take out the special objects at command centres, the big radar installations. And that gives you a clue as to how you really want to be flying this aircraft. You want to fly it offensively. You want to try and get that reload time down as often as possible and you want to be trying to destroy ground targets as much as possible to support your ground attackers and bombers. Dogfighting is not this aircraft's forte. Survivability, it feels fragile and it looks fragile. 400 hit points, damage resistance to 46, fire resistance mm, could have been better at six if it had been 60, it's 50, it's workable but it's not great. Airspeed, it's fairly good, third best in class here um, with a rating of 59. Cruise speed is 291, but the boost maximum speed is 484. Again, could be a little bit better. Boost duration is only 12 seconds, and that is not good. It's bad news, um, especially if you're fleeing from another multi-role. You're going to struggle to get away from most of them um, if you don't have a good lead on them immediately. As far as maneuverability is concerned, a bit of a mixed bag. It's reasonably maneuverable for a multi-role. It's better than the XP-672, it's not as good as the Tempest or the Seafang. It's almost exactly the same as the Corsair. It's not as good as the, the, um, the J7W1, but much better than the, one of these jets here, the ME-109TL. So you need to know which aircraft you're fighting as to whether you're going to try and use speed against it or whether you're going to try and use manoeuvrability against it, assuming it will let you, of course. And the altitude performance is not great either. It's theoretically third best in class, but it's a relatively low 38 rating here, 4,593 feet. And you're not really going to be able to take on any bombers flying at a, even medium alt altitudes, let alone high altitudes. But do keep an eye out for this climb rate. This might give you a clue how, as to how to escape some of the other multi-rolls, not all of them. You can see there are fairly close figures from, for instance, the XP-72, the ME-109TL but some of the other multi-rolls climb pretty sluggishly, as you can see. However, this is not going to get you away from fighters, so again, you need to know which aircraft you're fighting. Look at power-to-weight ratios. Um, there are none because it's a jet engine, so we've got the thrust-to-weight ratio of a 0.3. Now, that's actually not bad for a jet, so in theory, this might accelerate fairly nicely. We don't know how drag is implemented in the game, and if it is, or even if it is implemented in the game, if it is, we've got no figures on it. Now, we've already mentioned that the weaponry is worst in class, and I can tell you from experience, it really does feel like it's worst in class as well. Ordnance, best in class, and this is where I, you need to concentrate in order to make this air, aircraft have an impact. The survivability, you can see a lot of red appearing there. I did say it felt fragile. This is confirming it in the figures. Dive speed. Diving is not your escape route away from multi-rolls here. This is okay as a dive speed, but it's not anything significant, and there's that boost duration being um, highlighted as poor. And then there's a lot of red on the maneuverability, and this is because it's the degradation of your characteristics occurs quite quickly. If you build this for speed, and I feel that I, uh, that's what I want to do with this aircraft, you're quickly going to lose some of that maneuverability because the maximum optimum speed is only 350, 358 miles an hour. Now, I've been able to push this aircraft out to 500 miles an hour, so you can imagine it feels like a bit of a brick when you're going that quickly. However, it isn't built for dogfighting, so I'm prepared to pay the price on maneuverability um, when I'm going at a speed. And the altitude performance, as you can see there, red appearing. Um, just the climb rate is the, the, the good spot there. So where does this position this aircraft? Well, it's been left behind a bit by some of the more modern aircraft coming into the game. I mentioned at the start of the video that Wargaming, the World of Warplanes team, have changed their philosophy on reward um, vehicles. Um, and premium vehicles, and so that uh, the, the items that come into the games these days are often as good, if not flat out better, than their tech tree counterparts, which means that the old fashioned premiums like this, which were designed to be slightly worse than their tech tree counterparts, have been left lagging, and that's how it feels. What I recommend you do with this one is to try and maximize the impact the ordnance has, 
both by increasing its um, damage potential and by cutting that reload speed. Pick your dogfights very carefully, forget about defending, and go off and be as offensive as possible. And that way you might get some decent games in this, but this is not a carry aircraft. So, all that said, let's go and see how I've built the aircraft. Here we are with the J21RB again, and my instance of this aircraft is specialised. This means I've got all of the equipment and consumable slots available. When you first get this aircraft, what will you be missing? Well, as it's a premium aircraft, you'll only be missing two slots, one off the engine set and one off the consumable set. But unfortunately, it's off the engine, which is a nuisance, and even worse news, as far as the consumables are concerned, you're missing the slot for the outboard weapon, which means you can't do anything until you specialise this aircraft with this slot to improve the capability of your weapons. And that's a nuisance. Let's go and see what I have done with the aircraft. So we'll pop back into specialized, specialist configuration, back into service, and unsurprisingly, I've got a gun sight here. Don't think any of the other choices are particularly valid, but just for the record, they are cockpit armor. It's a very fragile aircraft. You can't build it as a tank, so why even try? That's my view. G suit, high speed maneuverability. Mm, well, you're not really looking for maneuverability in this aircraft by and large. And if you're at high speed, you're running away from something or trying to catch something up. So, maneuverability is not a, at a premium there. Detectability, again, if you're going at high speed, you'll soon be detected. If you're not, I don't really see the point in mounting this on this particular aircraft. So, it's the gun sight for me. Bonus characteristics are the ones that I would select. This is low DPS weaponry. You need to do everything you can to make it hurt the enemy as much as possible. So I pick the two bonus characteristics for crit causing critical damage and the one for cause chance of causing a fire. Before we go on, I've configured this aircraft mostly for maneuverability, but in the post-build effects section that's coming up, I'll do an alternative build where I substitute for this lightweight wing frame a polished skin and for the lightweight power unit, an uprated engine. And word of warning with the uprated engine, if you put on an ultimate level piece of equipment, um, your resistance to fire is going to go down to around about 34. And at that point, you're probably going to have to do at least one of the following two things. Put on a fire extinguisher or expend valuable skill points on the fire resistance and firefighter skills, or at least one of them. We have the lightweight wing frame here. This gives me extra maneuverability at the cost of some robustness. It's already a fragile aircraft. Losing a little bit more is not going to really make a difference. As far as bonus characteristics are concerned, I've got 3% roll maneuverability there, 1% your maneuverability, and then I've missed a 2% roll maneuverability characteristic at the bottom. And I'd probably, if I was reassembling this, since I've gone for a little bit of maneuverability, the philosophy there is that I'm wanting to make sure that I can fight other multi-rolls effect as effectively as possible. Um, certainly not fight most fighters that's for sure they'll still out maneuver you um, I would take away that cruise speed and put on the extra roll maneuverability characteristic lightweight power unit and here I've picked off engines resistance to critical damage yeah that's a nice one and acceleration with boost and um, activated I've got the half percent cruise speed well if I want that I should have picked off the one percent and the bonus characteristic that's leaping out at me here that I haven't picked off is the 2% yaw maneuverability. I'll probably drop um, I'll probably drop the cruise speed to get that one on. And then we have the high speed gas turbine. Now the problem with the high speed gas turbine is that it reduces the amount of boost to you and remember this has only got 12 seconds which is pretty poor for a multi-roll. However it does give you extra acceleration with boost activated and more maximum speed which gives you the chance perhaps to flee or flee from something that's trying to pursue a fighter perhaps as far as the bonus characteristics are concerned certainly i'd want the 15 percent um, engine cooldown rate however picking off the acceleration with boost activated i wouldn't do that these days there's a five percent boost availability characteristic there and that's the one i would go for and this is the most important piece of equipment, I think, for this aircraft, the strengthened hard points. At the cost of some speed, you can improve how quickly your ordnance reloads. And as you can see, at ultimate level, I've got a 21% increase in the rocket reload spe speed. Let's just quickly glance at the effect of that. The base, as you remember, speed for reloading the rockets is 60. I've got it down to 43. I'd like it to be less, but it's 17 seconds quicker. As far as bonus characteristics are concerned, I've concentrated on improving the rockets, so there's another 10% rocket reload speed, 5% um, rocket accuracy, and then there, 
probably the maximum speed with boost is the characteristic I would pick, so I'm happy with that. Okay, moving on to consumables. With this configuration, I think it's all right to um, mount the first aid dressing package and therefore spare um, um, the, the need for the fire extinguisher. And I don't feel that I need to concentrate on getting um, the fire resistance or firefighter skills here, but it, it's a marginal call. The aircraft does go on fire a bit. Then the pneumatic control assist uh, here for a little bit more manoeuvrability when I'm fighting something of a similar nature, just to try and outmaneuver them, perhaps even one of those P61s, for instance. Interesting choice here. I normally mount to engine cooling, engine restart swaps here, and I probably would mount engine cooling. In fact, let's put it on. If you're really interested in speed, then you'll go for improved mixture control. And then, of course, there are some gold consumables there as well, which I never talk about. Probably going to have to start doing that, actually. Talking of gold consumables, I do have incendiary, gold incendiary ammunition mounted. This increases the chance of fire. There are four machine guns on this aircraft and only one cannon, which is why I haven't picked the fragmentation. However, if you're not prepared to mount gold, then universal ammunition should be your choice. If you can, I would strongly consider trying to put on, when you've got the aircraft specialised, the heavy warhead. And that increases the maximum damage caused by bombs and rockets. If you don't want to put on the gold, then you'll get something of the same effect, not the entire effect, from mounting improved fragmentation. At the very least, you should do that. When you haven't got this slot available, Probably the first thing I would be looking at on the pilot is the Demolition Expert skill. And as you can see, I haven't got the Demolition Expert skill on this pilot here, the Hunter. And we'll pop one in the moment. But let's just show you the effect. The base characteristics for the rockets are 16,000 cumulative damage. And that's gone up to 19,200. We just find a pilot with Demolition Expert as well to pop on top of the heavy warhead and everything else. First one up is the Blenheim pilot and you can see that that figure has now gone up to 20,160. That's worth doing. But I find even without the demolition expert skill I was fine for destroying most of the special objects. Um, but don't miss that trick. And having started talking about pilot skills I think now's the time to go and discuss them in detail. This is the dialogue box for, box for the uh, pilot. Now, I've put the Hunter pilot back in the aircraft, and just a reminder, as a European Premium, you can assign this aircraft to any of the other major nations, not only the UK, but also the US, Germany, Japan, Soviet Union, and train those uh, uh, the pilots of, of those nations. This air, the pilot, therefore, is not um, configured specifically for this aircraft. If I was starting with a fresh pilot, I would probably go for the demolition expert skill first, especially if the aircraft's not specialised. If I've got a, a speed or manoeuvrability equipment mounted, go for aerodynamics expert, and then I would be concentrating on engine guru one and engine guru two, probably by means of going engine guru one, then across to Mars one one, taking this off when I had a point available to go for engine guru two, then going back and working my way up Mars one one and Mars one two to eventually make those guns a little bit more accurate. The guns aren't a strong feature on this aircraft, therefore I tend to concentrate on the speed and the ordnance. After that, long way in the future, I'd probably go for cruise flight and then possibly then build towards uh, resilience as well. Right, I think it's time to see uh, the post build effects, not only for the build that I've shown you here, but also one for speed. Here we have a spreadsheet summarising the effects of the build that you've just seen and also the build that I mentioned, the one for speed. What we have in column C and D are the base figures for the J21RB. You'll have seen these already if you looked at the aircraft statistics section. Then we have the effects of the build that you've just seen, which is a gun sight, lightweight wing frame, lightweight power unit, gas turbine and strengthened hardpoints. Those figures are in columns E and F. The difference between the two in absolute terms is expressed in column G and then as a percentage in column H. And then similarly, Similarly, we've got uh, the effects of a different build, which is gun sight, polished skin, uprated engine, gas turbine, strength and hard points, so much more about speed. Those figures are in columns I and J. The difference in absolute terms between those and the base figures are in column K. And then in uh, percentage terms, they're in column L.
In terms of the armament, as far as UI figures are concerned, we've improved the auto aim angle and also the dispersion angle, and that's 10% in every case on all three weapons groups for the auto aim angle and 24% on the accuracy. That result results in 4.4 degrees on the machine guns or an auto aim angle, so you can be off target by an extra 0.4 degrees and the game will correct your aim, and brings the dispersion, which is already pretty good for machine guns, down to 0.38, so it's now very good. And for the cannons, we've now got an auto aim angle of 2.75, which is helpful. And again, a dispersion angle of 0.38, which again is pretty good for cannons. There are important effects that you can't see here because they're not in the UI. But we have an extra 15% chance of inflicting critical damage and an extra 10% chance of inflicting or causing a fire. And those are really important on low DPS guns. When it comes to the ordnance, we've got a significant improvement. Base figure is 39 rating, we've gone up to 66, which is very nearly 70% improvement, which is interesting because what we've done is we've taken the cumulative damage up by 20% to 19,200. That's coming from the heavy warhead consumable, which is a gold consumable, remember? And my calculation says that we've brought the uh, re resupply down time down to 41 and a half seconds or thereabouts. The game actually uh, says 43. I'm not quite sure why there's a difference because both the game and I am reporting a 31% increase here. Now you can get this cumulative damage up a bit more. For if you have the demolition expert skill on your pilot, you get another 10%, and that would re result in 20,800 cumulative damage. Of course, if you only have um, the demolition expert because you won't use either of the two consumables that improve the um, damage output, quite why you wouldn't use the one that you can buy for credits, I'm not sure, but possibly you don't have the credits, you come down to 17,600. Let's just put that back to 20% because that's what you've actually seen. But bear in mind, you can do a little better than that. Survivability has come down by one point, and that's because we're losing hit points and also a little bit of damage resistance. But critically, we haven't lost any fire resistance, which means I still feel comfortable uh, mounting a first aid dressing kit. Airspeed, we've got some improvements here. Now we've got the gas turbine on, but Basically, the gas turbine cancels out the negative effect of the strengthened hard points, more or less. We actually go down a bit in cruise speed, which is unfortunate, but I calculate we'll go up to about 508 miles an hour under boost, and it does feel like that's uh, plausible. I say calculated because the UI shows quite a different figure. And I know for a fact that the UI is not showing the effect of Engine Guru 1 when Engine Guru 2 is in place. Why? I don't know. It's a bug. So I have to, uh, I'm going to go with my calculation here for 508. So the aircraft is quite a bit faster, 5% faster under boost, which is helpful when you're fleeing something. However, the penalty there is that you've lost 1.8 seconds of boost, it's 15%. Remember that I've got a bonus characteristic um, which I could have applied, which would give me 5% back. And that means that that would come down to 10.8 uh, instead of 10.2. Uh, um, and that would be a 1.2 second loss. And that's probably worth doing, in my opinion. On the maneuverability, we've got an improvement from 58 to 65. I think this takes this from being a bit of a brick to being something that's capable of fighting certainly other multi-rolls and some of the more maneuverable heavies. Um, but bear in mind, if you are going quickly, because of that low optimum speed, um, you'll quickly lose some of this uh, maneuverability. So bear in mind, this is only going to apply at fairly low speeds. Turn has uh, come uh, to turn for 360 degrees has come down to 10.25 seconds, which is a 7.64 um, percentage increase. This is my calculation, and we've managed to get the roll rate up to very nearly 130, 18.1%, which is useful. And because we're using the gas turbine, we've got a pretty useful increase of 22 feet per second uh, in the climb rate. And the climb rate could be the difference between you getting away from a pursuing multi-roll and not. So that's a good thing. So that's the maneuverability build. And to be fair, I don't think the effects are sensational, but they are in the area which makes this capable of fighting most of the other multi-rolls, not the fighters, but then that's not the aim, and all of the heavies. Um, whereas if you don't do this, you're not going to be able to turn with some of those multi rolls, and you're not going to be able to turn even with, say, a P61 if that's built for maneuverability. If, however, you decide to go for speed, here's what happens no difference on the guns, 
all the ordnance, so we'll ignore those. Survivability, it's still gone down by one point, but it's for different reasons this time. Your hit points have been restored to your full amount of 400. Well, that's not high anyway, so that's not um, that impressive. The damage resistance has gone back up by one point, not back to the 46, but to 45. But here is an important thing. We've lost 33% of our fire resistance skills, and I think this would demand that you either mount a fire extinguisher or you invest skill points off from your pilot on at least fire resistance or firefighter, and I'd be tempted to get both. And that's a compromise I don't like making, but maybe you'd be happy with it. The effect on the airspeed is quite considerable. It goes from a base rating of 59 to 66. That's a very nearly a 12% increase, and it's all about the cruise speed. Now we've got a significantly faster aircraft at cruise, and some of you will definitely like this. It's gone up to 354 miles an hour, 21.6% increase. Again, the gas turbine is offsetting the effect of the strengthened hard points, which is a negative effect. So there's not as much increase as you might expect, but still it's gone up to 512 miles an hour or thereabouts, 5.8% increase. It's an improvement over the, the um, maneuverability build. And again, we've lost 1.8 seconds of airspeed, uh, sorry, boost. But again, there's a 5% bonus characteristic. You can pick off the strength and hard points, which will actually put that back up to 10.8. And I would recommend doing that, as I said, just a few moments ago. On the maneuverability, well, now we are a bit of a brick. And this is where you would definitely be using speed to evade rather than maneuverability to try and outwit an attacking aircraft. The turn time has gone up to 11.41 seconds. The roll rate is back to 110, no other effects, but basically now you're flying in straight lines and you're not going to be able to fight many of the other multi-rolls, certainly not the fighters, and maybe not even some of the more manoeuvrable heavies. Bear that in mind. However, because of the speed build, the effect on the um, climb rate is very slightly improved by one foot per second from the maneuverability build to 497. Now, bear in mind, there are at least seven sources of in effects on your basic figures that is the choice of equipment as i've just demonstrated here the levels of that equipment stock advanced improved ultimate the calibration level of that equipment which may be varied from not calibrated at all to fully calibrated your choice of bonus characteristics your consumables can have effect an effect obviously pilot skills have an effect and Although I very rarely mention it, so does your choice of livery. I don't tend to mention the effects of the standard liveries on reducing the damage of the, air, uh, the aircraft takes from A and the, th and the things. But those seven things affect your bills. Now, any of those things, even if you opt for a fairly similar build to the one I'm showing here, could be different. And that means that the figures you get will be different to these. So these figures should be treated as indicative. But there you go. That is a maneuverability build and a spill speed build illustrated in numbers for you. And now what I think we ought to go and do is see how the aircraft performs in battle. The map for the forthcoming battle is Northern Bridgehead. It's the atonement variant, a five sector map with the sectors laid out roughly in five, the shape of five spots of a die. Strategically and tactically, we have an important sector in the middle. It's an airbase. Tactically, it allows easy access to the other sectors. And strategically, you can spawn there, which is really powerful. Um, when it's in a central location. You can get a different aircraft of the same tier if you're destroyed, if you so wish, or you can get full repairs. On an axis about the airbase are command centres, the other strategically important sectors on the map. These release bomber flights to attack enemy ground targets and try and flip sectors to your team. There's one near each spawn. On the other axis, we have a pair of garrisons. These are the make weights, one near each spawn. These re rarely feature prominently in battles on these this map look at the order of battle we can see i'm in my j21rb top tier we have a vampire f1 unspecialized an me329 also unspecialized an su9 that's a, one of the sniper russian multi-rolls an il10 it's also got a little bit of ordnance incidentally uh, an il10 ground attacker at tier 7 an me265 at uh, tier 7 another ground attacker and a yak 3rd which is very lightly armed although highly maneuverable and the enemy has a an IL-20, lots of hit points, lots of ordnance, a bit slow. A specialised vampire, so that's going to be good for the centre, I would guess. An ME-262 that's not specialised, and mm, an RB-17 that's not opposed by another RB-17, or indeed a heavy on our team. That is unfortunate. They also have a heavy, a VB-10 at tier 7, it's a good heavy this. An IL-10 Grand Attacker and a specialised P-51K, no doubt with Elise Clark in the pilot seat. 
As for going towards the centre, which is the province of fighters, this my aircraft is not a dogfighter in the presence of a specialised vampire and a P-51K fighting potentially just an unspecialised vampire dissuades me from thinking about going there. The obvious target is the command centre, and with my ordnance, if it's carefully placed, I can take out the special object. That's a little bit unfortunate for the three ground attackers on my team. My alternative would be to assume that my ground attackers can take this sector, go off to this garrison, and then, having taken it, hope that anybody who comes with me will help me attack this command centre. However, earlier in the day, I tried that tactic, and everybody left this garrison and went straight to the airfield. I was left on my own, and I failed, so I'm not going to do that on this occasion. Let's see how this battle panned out. We go into battle, let me mention that this is a natively recorded replay file, it's not one of World of Warplanes replay files, that means the reticle will be um, properly aimed, you'll see me zooming in and out, you may find the video a little bit jerky. And without further ado, I'm heading straight for that special object in the command centre, and we're going to see if I can try and take it out with these 10 rockets. I'm still experimenting with this to try and get the best layout, but basically it's four rockets grouped fairly closely together at the sheds. Two rockets at the large building and two rockets at the pillboxes, storage units. That's left me a rocket which I kept back in case I needed to fire it at, say, a shed that hadn't been destroyed. I could see that it had been destroyed. I should have reloaded these rockets, but I'm so busy shooting at these aircraft. I haven't yet. I've started to reload now. And that's my second air defense aircraft. Heading for the third. a few shots into that. I can turn with these ADAs with this maneuverability build. I really wouldn't be able to do that quite so easily with the speed build. Just have to run away and come back. I helped destroy the third aircraft and we have our command center. Now the airfield is still being contested so it's worth me going into there, there to see if I can help. There's the ME-262 front of me. I've got my rockets back, I'm thinking about going for ground targets, decide there's too much enemy activity for me to do that safely, I decide to try and take the M262. He's so busy with the heavy, he's allowing me to shoot him, and it's turning in such a way that I can still shoot him, instead of just running away from me. I decide to take the specialised aircraft, it's the Vampire, he goes and we have the airfield. That's a bonus, I didn't expect necessarily to get that. Now we see the P-51. Get a few shots into that. I know I can now turn that. He doesn't try to turn with me anyway. I chase him down. The speed build I'd certainly would be able to. I'm fast enough just to keep up with him and then he turns anyway. Get a fire on him. J7W1 shooting at me gets taken out by a teammate. Down goes the P-51. We've cleared out the threats here. Let's try and get this command centre. Now we're three sectors to two down because we brought, didn't take our garrison. So even though it feels like we're being effective, we're actually losing at this point. See the vampire? That's not good news. Have a few shots at the ADA. I don't turn fully with it, but I still managed to destroy it. I was about on the point of breaking off as I was worried the vampire was going to get behind me. The vampire is busy doing something else. And then I realised that for whatever reason, is it a speed build? Is it like the pilot skills? I'm actually out turning the vampire. I decide to stick with it. I continue to out turn the vampire. I shouldn't be able to do that unless it's a full speed build, in which case why isn't he running? Now I start shooting some of the air defense aircraft. And I notice that the heavies come in, the air defense aircraft almost gets in the way of the shots. He decides to try and run, but he also turns. And that's a mistake, he is trying to outmove me. That allows him to turn on him a bit more. And then you can see how long these guns are taking to shoot down that heavy. And that's not a, a heavy with a particularly high hit point pull. In the meantime, we've lost another sector. Here we go, We're going to try and take out 
the special object, and that was the wrong decision. I should have taken on the vampire instead. Hoped if I'd got the special object, we would have taken that sector. Uh, all I did was I fed myself to the vampire. So, tactical error there on my part. Back at the original spawn, we haven't got the airfield. Our command centre, which is, is under serious threat. I'm going to go in and see if I can save it. If I can't save it, then try and take it back quickly. Can't chase the 109 TL down necessarily, although in fact it must be out of boost or it's slowing down to try and take a target. Get just near enough to stop hitting it. I delay the capture of this sector by the enemy a little. Go down the Focke Wolf. And for the multi roll that could be about to address me, he's actually being shot by something else, so I can shoot him too. Mission mark, unfortunately, none of these are counting to retake in this sector. I have to kill the heavy. It's the third time in the game. I'm going to have to let the ground attacker get away. I've got to wait here and try and recapture this sector, but things are looking pretty bad. Two rockets there. Or tightly grouped against the sheds. Only release state rockets there. So I know that I've got to come back and finish off at least as part of that target. There it is. Fire the rocket. That will do that. That's a special object down. Shoot the air defense aircraft. I should have started to reload. I need to be quicker about that. That's the second time I've made that mistake. But I can try and use it here. Come round, fire the rocket into the three sheds, also shoot them, and with a bit of luck that will oh something dies here. That would have worked, but now it works. The wind legend goes through, and I go through a tree. Now we're gonna have to dice with the vampire. Well, let's see if we can outturn him again. Yes, he did on that occasion. Got a fire which he put out, so I know he's carrying a fire extinguisher. That means he hasn't got it. If I manage to kill his pilot, he won't be able to heal him. And he throws himself into the ground, and we still haven't taken the so Something else has died here. Well, it's not for want of trying. Finally, we do take it. I'm not the agent of the final capture, but I've done most of the work to get it. Very little choice but to go back to the airport, which we now take. And this leaves me with a quandary. Do I go straight for the garrison, or do I pick up repair pools? I'm fairly seriously damaged. I decide to pick up repairs. Hope against hope that my team can either shoot down the rest of the enemy team, or somehow managed to capture both of the enemy sectors without losing any, any of their own. Both are long shots. And then I head towards the garrison. And I find the vampire. Well, I've already proved to myself I can have turn in, but I make another tactical error here. It spots me. Answer me. Start shooting him. I release a rocket I should have avoided. I was fairly certain I'd survive that collision, even if it happened, but unfortunately I didn't. Now, he's dead, but so am I, which means we've got no chance of taking that sector. It doesn't actually matter in the big scheme of things, because we've lost one of the command centres anyway. But what I should have done is tried to outmaneuver the vampire and probably not release the rocket. And that was the end of my game. And here we are, 17,700 personal points, which is pretty good for this aircraft. First place on the team, Winged Legend, Lang Medal, decent effort, and this is about as good as it gets in the J21RB. Well, for me anyway, I hope that you can do better, but you're going to have to work hard to do that. Looking at the outcome of this battle, we can see it's a three chevron battle or a grade three multi-role fighter, which grows 288,726 credits, or silver if you prefer. Premium account bonus there is just over 96,000. If we drop into the message box, we can see that there were expenses of 9,400 credits. That was losing the aircraft twice. I was using prepaid consumables as usual. 
aircraft experience 5,691, premium account bonus 1,626 on top of a base of 3,253, other bonuses contributing the rest of that total. 283 free experience, the base there is 203, 81 coming from the premium account. And there's a couple of tokens. First medals of the day, the Lambert and the Winged Legend. Lambert, Winged Legend. Personal score tab. Well, we've got one of the class-specific missions complete, capture points received, not too surprising there. Four-fifths of the sectors captured, one complete by capturing four sectors exactly. This is going to be typical of your battles in the J21RB, I suggest. Not much defending. The low DPS of the guns mitigates against it. And that's why it's only for three chevrons. Personal points, 17,700. Four sectors captured, 17 aerial targets destroyed, but only 4,120 damage. That means one of two things, or both. I was shooting a lot of ADAs, which is true, or I was picking low health targets, which would be smart. 17 critical hits, probably coming from the cannon. Lost the aircraft twice, as mentioned before. 805 capture points, that was split 40 for defending, 765 for attacking. Managed to destroy four ground targets, uh, and as you saw, I was able to take out the special objects at the command centres. Uh, damage of 26,622. Now, if we turn to the team score tab, we can see that by personal points, that would have been first on both teams. By chevrons, first on my team, and equal second on the enemy team. Some reasonable contributions coming in from the IL-10 and the SU-9. The AK-3RD, not surprising that's a low score because that's got very poor weaponry. Here's where we really suffered. A couple of grand attackers not doing much, and then what looks like a vampire quitting the battle. On the enemy team, the scores are fairly sub-average. 7,000, 7,000, nearly 10,000 there. Consistent though from four of them, and I think this is probably where the difference was made. The RB-17 was unopposed by a heavy and therefore captured four sectors, and unfortunately that meant he dominated the game even with a low personal points tally. And it's my sincere hope that the World of Warplanes team will do something about these overpowered bombs in the game during 2023. That brings me to the end of the review section on the J21RB, an old-fashioned premium, that is one that's slightly worse than its Tech Tree counterparts, and in these days of premium heavies like the Twin Mustangs and the P61s, it feels like it's been left behind. As you've seen, I concentrate on trying to use its ordnance, and I pick my dogfights very carefully in order to get the most out of this aircraft. Well, I hope you found that useful, and that if you did, you'll come and see my future content. There is a bonus battle, unnarrated, coming up, but I'm going to leave you now, so until the next time, this is the Noble Q signing out.